let's go ahead and get started. Welcome all, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of uh, CNI, and you've reached uh, CNI's um, spring 2021 virtual meeting. Uh, this is the first day of our synchronous sessions. Uh, we will be doing synchronous sessions scattered throughout uh, this week. And next week, we will have some uh, plenary synchronous sessions. I do just want to remind you that we have also released a rich set of pre-recorded sessions, um, which are an integral part of this meeting. We're relying considerably um, uh, more heavily on on-demand sessions uh, this week. So. Um, please uh, take advantage of those as your time permits. Uh, there's a lot of really good material in there. Um, I want to note that this session is being recorded and we will be making it publicly available after the, um, after the uh, meeting is concluded. A couple of quick mechanical things. Uh, there is a chat. Please feel free to use it. Um, and there is also a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to put questions in at any point uh, as they occur to you. We will address all the questions after the presentations are complete. Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will uh, beam in and uh, moderate those uh, uh, questions. Uh, I would note we also have the capability during the questions, if you um, want to uh, pose a question by audio, you can raise your hands and we can uh, enable your, um, your, your audio. There is a closed caption um, uh, transcript available and please avail yourself of that if it's helpful to you. I think those are all of the mechanical things I needed to uh, mention. Uh, so let me move on to introduce this topic. And I'm really delighted that we have this topic on the agenda and um, Lisa and Heidi with us. Um, Heidi Imker is uh, from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. I always seem to want to say Champaign-Urbana. Um, and uh, Lisa Johnston is uh, from the uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, they are both key movers in the data curation network, which is a really, to my mind, extremely strategic effort um, that has been running for a number of years in sort of um, experimental mode with support from the Sloan Foundation. Um, it is one of the exceedingly few um, uh, genuine examples of an effort to scale up data curation across the research enterprise and the higher education enterprise. And um, uh, it's, it's, I think, really important. There, one of the themes that seems to be showing up in the CNI synchronous sessions that we have going this week is the one of sustainability. We have a lot of projects who are looking at pathways to genuine sustainability and those involve typically um, uh, issues around both funding and governance. Uh, and um, I am very eager to hear what um, the data curation network is thinking along those lines. So without taking up any more time, I just want to welcome you all today uh, to this session and to um, uh, thank uh, Lisa and Heidi for joining us. And I believe Heidi will begin the presentation. So I will disappear and hand it over to Heidi. Great, well, thank you so much, Cliff. That was a really nice introduction. Uh, and uh, we, we really appreciate that. And we may have quoted you uh, later on in our, in our slides. Um, so I'm Heidi, uh, and I am from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which we've used every permutation possible uh, for that name, so Urbana. Uh, Champagne, Champagne, Urbana is fine. 
So Lisa and I are going to just sort of ping back and forth a bit and we'll try and keep this you know, interesting uh, and, and lively as we go through, but I'll just give you an idea of kind of the, the structure of, of, of what we'll be talking about today. So I'll start with a brief overview of the data curation network for anybody who is um, unfamiliar or just sort of needs an update. And then we'll talk about the timeline for our sustainability planning, which has actually been going on for the entire time that um, we have been working on the data curation network. Uh, with that, that will hopefully uh, you know, orient everybody in terms of you know, what we're doing, what kind of sustainability we're, we're really talking about. And so then we'd like to take a really quick poll just to get a sense from our audience members, um, you know, where, what, why you came to the session and, and where, what your role is. And then from there, we'll go into specifics about, about the planning that we've done. So the data curation network, uh, our mission really is about connecting people. And so that's connecting people with curation, uh, data curation responsibilities. Um, and it's very much that idea of, you know, doing better together with that, you know, favorite African proverb that we, we all like to like to quote. Um, one thing I do want to say, though, is that uh, we came together really to figure out data curation. So this was not because this group of, you know, uh, individuals or, or universities had it figured out and we were banding together in our proudness. It was really because you know this was a problem that we felt like we needed to solve and we could solve it better um, together. So just to, to give you a, um, a little bit of context too, I came from a STEM background, which had a pretty specific, particular in the way that I was academically raised, a specific way in which curation was talk about, talked about and thought about. And when I interviewed for my position in 2014, I actually asked my, my search committee, I said, you know, what is data curation? And nobody could actually give me a very concrete reply. So it was, you know, fairly nebulous and very much in flux. And as nothing against the committee, there is, you know, some serious, serious talent and expertise on that committee, but it really did speak to the fact that it really hadn't been nailed down in this particular context in terms of generalist repositories and in terms of library services around data curation and this kind of really broad remit of, um, you know, this data sharing across so many disciplines. So my point really there is we wanted to try and nail it down and really to operationalize it. What is it in practice? We have these sort of nebulous you know, ideas, but literally what do you do in terms of data curation? So that was a lot of the impetus for the data curation network is really to nail down those, act uh, those actions and then try to really uh, standardize those across the different um, context and in uh, organizations that we're coming from and then really figure out what kind of expertise was needed because we could tell that you needed a lot, but we weren't exactly sure what it was, was going to be that would be needed. And then to share that expertise and share that work across, you know, distributed across this network then. So the DCN right there at the very top is really rooted in that curation, doing the action of curation as a network and the ability to then scale that, you know, our curation expertise and rely on each other and depend on each other, you know, in these actions. As I just told you though, and I think it's probably likely that many of the people who are in attendance today have experienced themselves, there was just not a lot of co concrete cohesiveness in our practices. They were sort of similar, but it was like, oh, you do this, when, you do this, that. So that was one of the things that we really had to do was try to, to work out what it would really be. So that meant there ended up being a, an educational component that really layered right in right after we, we, we started this. So and that happened in terms of professional development and then the creation of some best practices. So for example, this has come out in the data curation primers, which you may have heard about, and also um, codifying the curate steps is what we, what we call our, our curation outline. This also ended up leading to just straight R&D. So it turns out there's a whole lot of questions that are just fundamental to, to data curation, particularly in the context, who has data, who's trying to curate, what is valuable about it? Is it valuable to the same thing to the end user or to the depositor or to you or to me? Um, so there's all these fundamental questions that have come out uh, around it too, which, which makes a lot of sense. But then the last part is really this piece about sustainability, which is what we're going to focus on today. So how can we do this sustainably? So the grant would end. We all know grants end. That's how they work. Uh, so what were we going to do when it was over? Because we knew that the data stewardship would not be over and we would need to um, continue to continue moving on. So I really wanted to frame, you know, where the DCN started. So what was it like when we first started uh, in 2016? Uh, and what have we learned and figured out, you know, as we've, we've gone on and particularly about uh, curation and, and scale. So we began with this planning phase. This is a planning grant that was funded by Sloan. It was a, a one-year uh, grant uh, from 2016 to 17. And we initially started with um, six uh, institutions and then moved to eight. 
Uh, we were then awarded an implementation grant from, again, from Sloan uh, from uh, 2018 to, to now, 2021. We grew from eight to 12 partners at that point. And then now this is our transition. Um, wh what do you do after the grant is? So we're, we're smack in the middle of that transition right now. We currently have 12 partners. Um, and then we, after this, uh, we hope, we plan, we believe there is a, a sustaining phase that will come, that will come afterwards. So uh, Lisa, is there anything you wanted to, to jump in and say uh, before I- No, nope, let's hit the poll. Okay, so yep, that was a little bit of background on us. Uh, so just to give some context and so you know what we're really kind of talking about here. And so now just a little bit about you, quick three questions. So I have launched the poll. Can everyone see that? Lisa and Heidi, do you see the poll? Yep, I can see it. Okay, great. All right, we're starting to get some responses now. Perfect. Okay. We are at about 80% still ticking up. I think I'll leave this up for another 10 seconds or so. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close down the poll with 86%. All right, thanks everybody for participating. Shall I share those results out now, Heidi? That would be great. There we go. You know, I really thought there'd be a lot more unicorns. I, I did. I thought this was a covert social science experiment. But... <laughs> very good. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, we'll think about that. Uh, you know, as we as we move forward through through the slides, and um, hopefully this will uh, key in on some points that are important to you. So uh, back to this data curation network timeline that I had mentioned. So uh, this was in fact our sustainability timeline. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was literally built into the very first, first grant, the planning grant that we, we submitted and has been part of it um, throughout the entire course. So we'll talk about some really great benefits to that, that it's been so integral to the entire process that we've been, um, that we've been working through, but also a few things that, that made it hard. So first, just sort of a kind of a clue about what our thoughts were at these different sorts of sort of phases. So, you know, like I said, it was literally part of the grants. So, and especially when you're just working on a grant, you, you know, you have no actual obligations yet. And it's, you know, it seemed really smart. It was like, oh, wow, it's super proactive. Everybody knows that that's really hard and it takes a lot of preparation. So it was, it was terrific. It just, it made, uh, it made a whole lot of sense. And then we, we got into, you know, really trying to implement the network and we were trying to implement the network. And so that was part of it that ended up being really difficult because we were trying to, you know, figure out sustainability and, you know, we'll give more details about that in a few minutes, but uh, it felt kind of awkward in the middle of it because the sustainability is, is somewhat of a research project in and of itself and we were just trying to figure it out. So one of the analogies that, that we've used then it's a, like a little bit like trying to figure out the market for an ice cream shop and we're still trying to raise the cows. So Lisa and I are both from the Midwest and actually grew up in a dairy farm so that speaks to me a lot. Um, but it was very much like, we're like, what's Jira? What do you do? What do you do? And then like sustaining something that is actually, you know, fairly in, in flux, you know, uh, just definitely our, our ideas changed uh, as we went along. So it's definitely to the um, credit to, you know, the DCN Koki eyes and, you know, certainly Lisa and Claire and Tim, who uh, did a lot on the sustainability. Um, so we took it very, very seriously and we did a, a ton of work. So really that first you know, kind of takeaway is, is the amount of research and prep that went into this was just, um, it was, was really huge. And again, we'll, there'll be more details in a minute. Really huge, but <laughs> despite years of knowing that this would happen and the fact that we worked very hard on our sustainability plan, it still feel like that, that grant end came out of nowhere. It still was like, we had the meeting, we're like, well, it's time. And it was really, uh, sort of sort of alarming to us. Uh, so that's the other kind of takeaway uh, to, to, to think about is that it really does require, you know, this a length of time to plan. I could only assume there's probably one or two maybe on the call who are like, oh no, it took you that long. We could do it in a month. And I'm like, no, I don't believe you. Like, I just don't. It was, it was, and you'll see in terms of what we did, you know, we tried to be super thoughtful about it, but we did still end up moving, um, you know, multiple times during this process and we still are moving. So it's still not, um, exactly concrete. So what did our journey really look like? Um, so, you know, 
Uh, again, uh, the sustainability was outlined in both our planning and implementation grants. So for example, before we even went into implementation, we were already looking at cost models and interviewing stakeholders. So that was you know, mainly at that point, um, our own you know, administrations. Once we moved into that uh, implementation phase, it got more intense and we did a lot more activities. So talking with a lot of organizations who were similar to us in terms of the structure and kind of what we were trying to doing you know, across multiple institutions or had tried to, to transition from a grant into sustainable. So for example, we talked with Seed and we um, talked with Portage and Texas uh, Digital Library, uh, lots of different places. Can I just interject on that, Heidi, too? And Cliff mentioned this at the beginning. You know, when we talked about like sustainability, it wasn't just like the fiscal models and like the financial models. We were also looking to other organizations to ask questions about their governance structure. Do they have, you know, memorandums of understanding? How do they actually solidify that partnership? So all of these kind of pieces went kind of hand in hand, also figuring out how do we keep paying for this in the long term? Yeah, yeah. It Exactly. It's almost similar to data curation in which it was like a little bit abstract in some ways and like, no, this is literally what you'll have to do. And this is literally, you know, how much, how much it takes. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for popping in there. Um, and in terms of, you know, we, so we engaged a, a panel and so that included a variety of academic institutions of different scopes and sizes. Um, and then also some uh, data curation organizations completely outside of, you know, academic libraries to try and get a balance in terms of what we were trying to achieve. We also did um, a request for proposals uh, for consultants and we ended up, which is you know, an experience all in of itself. Uh, and then we ended up working with Lyrsis. Um, they have a report that's available if you'd like to read it. Um, and they did end up sort of recommending or coming out with uh, three different models for us to consider. One was tiers with the idea that that could provide some broader representation. One was kind of a stakeholder uh, model, which was more tightly aligned, you know, very, very similar organizations. And then the final one then was a, a fee for service. So I think Lisa will maybe say a little bit more about that later, unless you wanted to chime in now. Uh, no, I can say more about that later. Yeah, go for it. Great. Great. So from there, we had a, a bazillion conversations within our group. We talked and talked and talked and talked and really tried to get to a consensus and figure out, you know, what was really best for us and what we could do going on now. We did end up with a membership model uh, and uh, that we'll talk more about that for sure later. And then basically you bite your fingers and you, you start the ask and you see what happens when, when the rubber hits the road. Yeah, and I can talk more about the rubber hitting the road piece of the show here. Um, you know, when I look back on our journey, I, I observe that even though we did plan early on, we did we actually had to change directions a couple times during the way. Um, so Heidi really mentioned, like we looked at this fee for service model. And in fact, in our in our planning phase, when we were really just thinking about the, the network and, and building it out kind of on paper, we thought like, you know, there's a lot of membership fatigue out there and all of the experts we're talking to are sort of warning us that it's really difficult to become yet another organization that, you know, goes hat in hand and asks for um, uh, membership fees from a variety of institutions. So we thought maybe we should really test out this, this fee for service approach where perhaps we can package up curation um, and and really uh, get end users to to pay for that and and help us sustain the data curation network. Of course, once we started the implementation phase, um, then we started to realize all of the real problems with that approach, at least for our particular, you know, service data curation. Um, so one thing we discovered is you know data curation in terms of the networked matchmaking type approach that we were using. Uh, is actually very difficult. Um, we we share our curators across a group of institutions where you know Minnesota might have expertise in, in the biological sciences and we can curate the biological data coming into Illinois while they might help us with our computer science resources or whatever. Um, there's really not a lot of um, you know quantifiable like this is how much it costs. Each data set is going to take a widely variety you know a wide variety of different steps. And, and different expertise. And we can't always guarantee all of these things are gonna align and offer that as a fee for service, at least not today. Um, data curation is also very uh, professionalized work. Um, a lot of ethical components, a lot of um, decision-making has to happen you know, behind the scenes. And there's really not a 
you know, one size fits all approach to how we do curation. And that's something we actually have to teach in our workshops. You know, we take a very pragmatic approach to make data a little bit better. Um, we can't, you know, make the perfect data set. So that also was kind of um, difficult to translate into a operationalized, you know, uh, high quality service expectation for every single um, data curation event. Um, we also uh, realized, and this is uh, through a lot of our satisfaction surveys that we did on our own curators who are doing this work as a part of our implementation phase, they are really busy people. Um, and curation is not their only job. Um, all of our, our staff in the data curation network are um, research data management librarians and reproducibility specialists and software developers working on the repository. So they, they also do curation as a part of their job, but this isn't the only thing they do. So for them, an exchange of data curation with a peer makes a lot of sense. I'll do your biology data sets if you do my computer science data sets, but doing that work for an end user where there is no exchange except for sustaining the network didn't really translate in value for our actual curators. So that was you know, a huge realization for us that really meant that this wasn't necessarily gonna be the best approach. Finally, just the logistics of accepting fee for services from end users in an academic institution is quite challenging. Um, we, we really did a lot of research on, you know, what would it actually take to set this up? And a lot of the answers we found was, well, the DCN is going to have to become a nonprofit organization. And there's actually quite a lot of benefits uh, for, you know, staying housed as a fiscal home at a university. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of things that our university um, has been able to provide for us uh, that we just weren't able or maybe willing to try to start doing, um, like taxes and, um, you know, collecting the actual money and, and all of the, the, the oversight that needs to go into that. Audit. So, yeah, go for it. I mean, just audits, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so we really uh, decided that, you know, this, this approach that we thought, you know, theoretically would really work for us. And a lot of the literature and the research was really pointing us down this direction um, was really just practically not a good fit for us right now, given, you know, the unknown market for some of these end user services. So we really had to look inward and, and say, what is going to work for us, our current membership right now? And, um, you know, for that, and you can go to the next slide, Heidi, um, we discovered that a membership model is actually going to be the best approach. Um, and we might have be able to scale up later on to you know, offering a wider variety of services to end users. But right now, we, we do really have a very strong trust relationship built up amongst our partners. And we want to continue um, to you know, expand on that. So we are um, uh, creating three tiers of membership right now. Um, one of them is that uh, you know, partner tier, which is uh, we're actually you know, looking for new partners uh, to join us. But you know, these are institutions that have curators who are um, also interested in sharing curation at this network to scale. And, and really trying to, as Heidi already described wonderfully, build out the, the actual workflows and practices for how we can do this in our institutions. Um, the other tier, you know, is completely untested. And, and that's uh, a tier that we're, we're hearing people are interested in, um, that, uh, you know, you're just getting started with curation. You might not even have a data curator on staff, but this is an area that you'd really like to move into or you see a need to move into, but you need to learn more and you need to learn, you know, from a network of experts or who are already kind of doing this. So that's where imagining, you know, where it might be a different kind of involvement and we'd really like to beta test what that actually might look like uh, in this this transition year and then finally um, we do still offer a lot of our um, educational workshops uh, and we see a real value in ensuring that you know we're just preparing our curator community um, to tackle some of these problems so we want to continue to do that and and we're really looking to um, you know get support to teach these workshops and that's what that that ambassador uh, level was for um, in the future, we need to look for other ways to continue to engage, but maybe individuals 
uh, there are a lot of uh, individuals who work in institutions that may not be at that level to, you know, partner in this this membership model, um, who who are also just looking to get involved in the community, and um, we just we're trying to figure out how to create that opportunity for them. And then we definitely recognize that the current DCM members are um, maybe large uh, R1 institutions, and certainly there are a lot of um, opportunities to engage with a wider variety of institutions. And we wanna ensure that we are, you know, really making a welcoming and inclusive community uh, for, for everyone. So those are the two kind of future areas that we'd like to look to. Um, so what's great uh, about this, this current uh, uh, testing of this, this new membership model is we actually got 11 of our 12 institutions to sign on as partners. Um, and and right, what that means right now is uh, we're sharing all the central costs and that comes out to $10,000 per institution, plus the in-kind donation of the curator expertise to the network. Um, we also have been receiving interest from others to do beta testing at those different tiers. Um, and and we, we just really appreciated uh, the support that we, we heard from Cliff and uh, wanted to highlight that. Um, we really are uh, really striving to, to kind of meet these expectations that we are trying to test out a radical collaboration for doing this kind of work in, in academic libraries. And it's, it's certainly not hard, but it's, it's possible. Um, I'm sorry, it is hard, but it's, it's also possible. And um, we, we really are trying to, you know, <laughs> learn by doing, I guess, is, is what we're finding out is, is really the only way uh, to try to do some of these sustainability um, uh, approaches. So I think I turn it back over to you, Heidi. Yeah, yeah. So there's, I mean, the things that are great are there's a, a lot of enthusiasm and um, it by and large is working. So that's a really terrific part of it. Um, we do feel the pains of the things that aren't so great uh, about what we're trying to do right now. Uh, first and foremost, we are baffling our campuses. So uh, Lisa can say me a little bit more from the fiscal agent uh, perspective, but I'll just say even as one of the partners, so I go to them with a draft membership agreement and they totally don't get the idea that we're trying to share the staff and trying to share our time. They're like, what are you giving away for? And you're like, no, it's a swap, it's a swap. I don't know how many times I use the word swap, you know, in that in that conversation. And we have a great grants and contracts person. It's, it's terrific. It's just not at all the way that they're they're used to thinking. And also they're used to thinking about, you know, sort of liabilities and those sorts of things. So you come to it and they're like, oh, don't agree to this. Don't say this. Don't don't promise this. Don't promise these things, but make them promise it. And it was like, oh, no, no, no. We need, we need everybody to agree to be obligated to these things. Otherwise, I can't depend on Michigan and Cornell and Minnesota to do these things. Like, we have to be responsible to each other. So that was really kind of going against, uh, you know, a, a grain uh, in and of itself and to try and explain um, to a lot of different people, like, what we're trying to do and, and what it means to us. Lisa, do you want to say anything about the, the fiscal home part? No, I might need some therapy, you know, like that, this is just a really difficult experience, like setting up these agreements and pushing it through our legal counsel. Like it's, it's pretty, um, yeah, it's, it's not what I've been trained to do, right? You know, and, and um, we have a lot of structures that are universities in place to help us through these, but they're really not used to um, collaborating with our peers like this. So it's been, it's been a struggle. Yeah, and that's been uh, fascinating. Uh, also, in terms of one thing that's not so great is losing out on, on talent. So say we have, you know, an organization that's in the data curation network and they have to exit or they were never able to come in to begin with. So, uh, you know, in one case, maybe we only were thin on uh, our curators, for example, and if that organization left, then there goes our, our curator. So that sort of like there's a, a, a loss of talent for us. And then it's also a loss of um, you know, them being able to engage with us. So that's been something that's been awkward about this, um, about this, this sort of model. Um, also, as I, as I mentioned, the sort of preemptive uh, sustainability planning. So this idea that we're you know, trying to market our ice cream and Bessie's not a twinkle in anybody's eye yet. We're really trying to figure out what we're doing, which means that we've been pivoting a lot. And we've also been then forced to make decisions that may not be the right thing long term. They might need to, we expect that they probably will have to evolve. It's not to say that, you know, it's not good that we were forced to make decisions because the grant's ending. So we did need to do that. But it was does mean that things aren't as fixed as, um, you know, we think that they, they are. And one thing that I, you know, kind of have noticed is happening is like, once you put something on a website, or once you say it's one way, it really fixes in people's head that that's the way it is. But we really are still trying to figure out well, what, how do we continue to tweak this 
um, so that it works best for what we're trying to do and also the, the, the people that we're, we're trying to do it with. And then, yeah, uh, I think Lisa just alluded to this maybe a little bit, but we're not, <laughs> right, we're also not sales salespeople. Uh, this is not our, our, our natural inclination. So this means, um, and we didn't have some cohort of, you know, smooth talking people in the data curation network that we just, you know, banded together to go out and, you know, give, give you know, snazzy slides and pitches to people. It was just us going back to our administrations and, you know, some people are more comfortable with that than others. And, you know, that can be awkward. And then it's also the idea that it's also hard for administrators. So you've got a bazillion different, you know, things that want to be funded and you've got this amount of time and you're having to try and tease out and maybe extrapolate a little bit, you know, what is the value? So that's one thing that I think we've struggled with a, a, a little bit too. Well, yeah. you, you also mentioned, Heidi, what is the value? I mean, I remember at one point we were like Googling like value proposition. <laughs> so we, we had a lot of a really strong learning curve um, to really tackle some of these sustainability issues. Yeah, market analysis. Okay, what is that again? You know, these were just things that, you know, even with the consultant, they were still hard, kind of in the similar way of the grants and contracts, but it's a little bit hard for us to wrap our minds around. Um, so, uh, yeah. So just kind of um, wrapping up a, a little bit here. Uh, so it really has come down to, you know, when we think about some sort of takeaways that, you know, we thought would be useful for the people, really, it does take an enormous amount of effort to try and really hit all the points that you'd want to do. And it really does take a, take a lot of time. Um, so those are sorts of things. And then really a lot of this has also kind of really come down to, to values. And there are different values for, for different people, of course. And I had found this quote um, from Paul Hawken, who is actually um, an, uh, an environmental sustainability activist, but it really spoke to me about this idea that the first rule is to align with your natural forces or at least not defy them. And I think if you had shown me this quote at the very beginning, I'd been like, yeah, 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 that's what we're doing. You know, our natural forces is to bind together and then, you know, be able to do this thing and hadn't actually really thought about these other sorts of natural forces that are in play. You know, first of all, is, you know, this idea of how our universities are structured to work. They are individual universities that are set up to value themselves. Mm -hmm. Of course, we understood that, but we didn't really think about how that was going to apply and apply to the actions and the actual work and the kinds of things that we were going to have to do. Um, in terms of, of moving this forward and the amount of effort that it would take to, you know, really try to get over those hurdles, you know, within our own, own in universities. And then this also this idea that, you know, um, I think almost everybody on this is, is going to be part of academia or at least closely aligned, if not, you know, and particularly those in libraries, we don't pitch. That's not what we're, we're help. We want to help. <laughs> that is the entire ethos of, of why we're here. So that's one thing too, where we've really kind of struggled around, you know, we, we can do this in, in certain ways, but then who do we leave behind or how do we not help the rest of the community? So that's one area where we're, we've really been, um, really continue to, to, to push on and, and to try and think through. So I, just a few maybe final uh, take homes then for the DCN specifically, um, just to know that particularly because of the timing, and again, we're glad we were pushed, but because of that timing, we did, we are still testing and we had to make decisions for what to try now and particularly for ways to maintain, but we do expect that will evolve. And then just for sort of for this, you know, concept of sustainability and moving from a grant into an organization is looking out for all of the natural forces, not just the ones that, that seem most obvious to you. They, like Lisa said, they're not insurmountable, but they will feel very uncomfortable and they will just really take a lot of time and energy more than you think that they, they will. Um, and so I think at least me particular, I felt, you know, sort of blindsided um, by, by some of that. And we've, we worked it out, it's been going okay, but um, I would have wanted to hear that <laughs> presentation. So I was prepared. So that's, that's a, a message for you. Um, so finally, just, you know, thanks to you for, for your interest in, in attending. Um, and we'll take some uh, questions uh, in a few minutes here. It's certainly our thanks to everyone for contributing to the data curation network um, and, you know, Tim and, and Claire again for their work on the sustainability projects. Um, our thanks to Josh Greenberg who at Sloan who pushed us, you know, very early to start this. So I, I think it would have been very easy to push off and push off and push off until it was way too late um, if it hadn't been built in so, so much to the, to, the, um, to the grant process as it was. And then, uh, so there's our, our website uh, that our sustainability plan is available. So under about, under publications, um, and I can actually put it in the link here uh, in a few minutes too, uh, if, if you'd like to take a closer, closer look at it. Any uh, closing thoughts you'd want to say before we open it up, uh, Lisa? I, I guess I would just add that, you know, we, we ultimately, we changed our minds about sustainability. We thought we could sustain ourselves one way 
and we we changed um, based on how we felt as individuals in this collaboration. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. I, I think you, you do have to stay true to like your your values and and we value our people and how our individuals feel about the work that they're doing. We couldn't collaborate otherwise. So our sustainability model really had to reflect how our individuals felt about this work. And um, hopefully that'll, that'll work out for us, but I guess it, it's okay to change, change your mind about sustainability. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, wonderful talk. So interesting. And really appreciate your um, your your honest um, description of the, the the challenges that you faced and and um, how you were called to uh, bring certain kinds of uh, skills to bear on a thorny problem with a situation that wasn't necessarily part of what you were used to to dealing with. I think we can all relate to that, and it was great to hear about it. Um, I do want to. Uh, invite our attendees to please share some questions and comments with us. We already have a few there and I'm gonna read them now, um, but please um, feel free to do so in the, in the Q&A box and I'll, I will read them aloud for Lisa and Heidi. Uh, you also have the option of raising your hand and I'd be happy to um, unmute you and um, you, can raise, you can ask your question um, aloud if you like. So I'll go ahead and begin with a question that came in through the chat. Um, this may be a question for another talk, but do the faculty or researchers have parallel concerns to the grants offices about sharing their data with people that they don't know? Um, I can take that one if that's okay, Heidi. Um, actually, we built our, our DCN, our Data Curation Network Workflow to address that very problem. We actually don't share data with our institutions that isn't already going into a public access data repository. So all of the data that we curate is meant for public access. Um, and we also talk to our researchers about this in different ways. Um, each local institution has, uh, has the ability to, you know, very explicitly explain to their researchers that someone outside of the organization may be curating their data. But even when we do that, um, we, you know, the data is already going to be publicly available anyway. So we really do try to um, let the local institution handle that. And we want the local institution to have all of that relationship building um, aspect as much as they need. So for example, at Minnesota, um, when, I when I get something um, curated by the network, I'll, I'll just say, you know, our Python data curator is looking at this and that Python data curator might be at Illinois or Penn State. So um, yeah, we, we really do pay attention to that very much. Yeah, and that's another area too, where I think we've had to be pretty flexible because again, different universities actually work in a little bit different ways. The way that they get their own funding is a little bit different. Um, so we've had to be, you know, those are ways that we had to be flexible in terms of, you know, determining how the network operated. At Illinois, we say, hey, we want to send this to the data curation network. This is what it is. It's actually kind of nice marketing for the, for the data curation network. Uh, and then, so we give them, you know, the opportunity if for some reason they wouldn't feel comfortable. But as Lisa said, all of it is, is meant to be public. Anyway. Great. Thank you. And thanks, Monica, for the question. Um, we also got a question in from Emily who writes, I must admit that I'm a little concerned about another membership model in the library space. Currently, I sit on a few boards and have worked in the library nonprofit space, and I have seen memberships drop in all of those organizations. I often call it the new shiny thing syndrome. Organizations tend to join early on, but then when a few institutions pull membership, there's often a spiral. Is there an alternate plan if membership drops? Um, well, first, I just want to acknowledge, Emily, yes, that we're, we're afraid of that, too. <laughs> we didn't really um, go this direction, maybe, in some ways, because we knew that this was a problem, but it's tractable. Sorry. Well, we're also trying to launch a new membership model in COVID. Um, that's also, I mean, we didn't mention that, but that's also kind of the, the other major factor that we've been uh, struggling with. Um, so we're really excited that we've been able to come this far. I think what what we're trying to keep in mind is that um, we're not we're not just another membership organization. I guess it, maybe we're just blind to ourselves, but we, we really are um, sharing our staff in a really radical way. Um, so so it, it yes you know 
data curation is a kind of a new, newer, shinier thing. Um, but we're doing it in such a way that we we really are becoming interdependent on one another. Um, it, 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 we're really uh, we're making our ties closer as we work together. So um, at least it's our thought that uh, our memberships will actually pull people together um, in ways that will make us, you know, very uh, very dependent on one another. What do you think, Heidi? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Just to, to be explicit, we have thought of other things and we've you know sort of teared it pared it down in terms of like, well, what if this didn't happen or this didn't or the people pull out? And so what ends up happening is that you have a reduction in what you can offer or you pivot really kind of dramatically. You know, so do we no longer actually share our staff? Or do we just have a Slack channel? So, you know, you have to end up really changing your mission really quite a bit depending on how that goes. So, you know, we've got our eyes wide open about that. And um, yeah, we were, grateful and, and delighted that in COVID, you know, we have been able been able to do this well, because it's absolutely on our minds that, um, you know, that there is that fatigue, fatigue going on. And right now, I mean, we've got 46 data curators in our network, um, you know, and for the $10,000 that it costs for membership, that's much more uh, affordable than trying to hire even just one more data curator for our library. So we, we really are trying to, um, show that this this is a way of collaborating it's not just a membership to another organization it's it's really just the, the cost of collaborating in this radical way thank you yeah thank and thank you thank you emily um and thank you for for addressing that concern and emily uh just chats um i appreciate the thought you've put into this and that you're doing this in in covid so um, and I just wanted to comment also along those same lines um, with respect to membership inquiries. Uh, we did we, we did receive a private chat prior to somebody having to leave this webinar um, asking the question about um, joining opportunities, uh, membership opportunities. And so what is, uh, and forgive me if I missed that during your presentation, but if someone does is interested in joining, uh, what's the process and uh, how can they do that? Yeah, and we intentionally did not make this a commercial, but thank you for asking. I will certainly be happy to share that information. Um, we, we do have a membership application that's open uh, through the end of April. Um, we will be reviewing applications based on the members um, that are interested in joining, based on the expertise that they bring, to be honest. Um, it's, it's not just about the, the fee. We, we really want to grow our network in a way that um, fills maybe some of the domain expertise that we may be lacking um, or the, the file formats for, for curators who can curate you know, particular file formats. Um, and so there's actually a list of preferred you know, um, areas where we'd really like to add additional expertise and partners to our network. Um, we're also interested in learning or hearing from partners that are different from our own, um, that, that aren't just maybe our ones, but are maybe um, representing institutions that are just not like ours and will bring additional you know, diversity and a, a variety of other concerns or interests to the group so that we can um, really grow in a way that's, that's gonna be um, you know, more uh, useful to the broader community. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, I also just wanted to be sure that everyone had had noticed the comment from Carl Benedict um, when you were writing about the process of planning for sustainability um, and you know how much time and energy that took, and when it was time, you still couldn't believe it was actually time. And Carl commented um, that he's connected to a couple of projects. We're two plus years out from the end of the project was still not early enough. So clearly that's a, a universal experience or, or very common. Uh, we do have, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just, and so the really hard thing about that is like, you're trying to do market research, but you haven't actually pinned down exactly what you're doing yet because you're still <laughs> trying to tweak the network to make sure it works. So that's, you know, part of that is why people push it off because they're not we're not sure what they're selling and we're, we don't want to sell anything. Um, so that's that's really that challenge there is, is trying to figure out how to how to work in the context of figuring out sustainability while you're still kind of jiggling around. Yeah, very true, very true. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Carl likes the, the ice cream shop cow metaphor, <laughs> which was a good one. All right, well, we, we um, 
we have we have some more time to chat with our um, panelists. And again, we're so grateful for them uh, for coming to CNI uh, to talk to us about uh, their their project and the this this process. We are so grateful to all of our attendees for making time uh, to be with us here. Um, as I see that we don't have um, any more questions in the Q and A, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording. Um, but I invite any attendees who would like to uh, remain with us here and sort of approach the podium, um, ask questions, uh, have a chat with our uh, presenters. Please feel free to do so. Otherwise, uh, wish you all a great rest of your day. Hope to see you back at our next session at CNI which will happen in about 45 minutes or in one of our other sessions in the next um, couple of weeks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.